Will you pray with me, please? God of goodness and mercy, of gentleness and kindness, be the light of our salvation and sustain our souls. Through your word and through your son, renew us and transform us again into your holy people. And I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. <clears throat> In the newsletter this week, I made a connection between Bob Marley and John the Gospel writer. And right before I sent that out, I wondered if people would think that John's being cute or too modern, mixing things that shouldn't go together like Bob Marley and John the Disciple. But I didn't care. I mean, I didn't think so. <laughs> I didn't think so. So off it went into the world of the internet, never to be retrieved, never to be erased, and always attributed to me. C'est la vie. The reason I think they do go together is because they both wrote about the same thing. Love. And how the love for one another can change the world. Well, this morning, I thought of another one. Another comparison to make with John the Disciple, and this is none other than Tina Turner who famously sang, What's Love Got to Do With It? Now, I do admit that when she sang that song, she questioned the emotion of love, but in a way that I still think puts her in the same class of instructors as Bob Marley and John. Why? Well, let me start by saying this. When you read through the gospel and the two letters in the New Testament that John wrote, you quickly noticed that they are very different from all the other writings, especially the gospels, that are also in the New Testament. Because all he writes about is love, love, love. And if you don't pay attention to what you are reading or hearing, spoken aloud to you one Sunday, you may miss what is actually being said. We all may miss the point of what is being said, because if we only hear these small snippets every Sunday, we lose the whole picture and forget why these writings are so important. So think about all of this for a moment. John most likely wrote his gospel after the year 70 A.D. And that is important because in the year 70, Jerusalem was attacked by the Romans and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. After years of occupation and trying to put down any opposition to Roman rule by the mostly Jewish inhabitants, the Jews were forced out, dispersed, and would not return for another thousand years. What also happened was that the traditional way of being Jewish and being uh, celebrating the religion and all the holidays went away because everything was centered on that one temple in Jerusalem. And so the people had to decide what to do. It could have very easily have just died right there. I mean, how do you worship God when the only place God lived was destroyed? So to make, try to make this history lesson a little short, people simply went different ways. One way was to try to make the best of the old, with things like synagogues taking on a central role instead of this one temple. Another way was to follow certain rabbis wherever they went, and whatever they taught, and that's still done today. But another way that was growing was to follow a certain rabbi named Jesus and the way that he taught his disciples to live, which was to live 
still as God's chosen people, and to love God as God loved them. And this is what John wrote about in his gospel and two letters. Love and love as the way to live. One love. The love of Christ and everyone who followed this way. This gets even more interesting when you consider that the two letters of John, which greatly expand on the theme of love and his gospel, were written, well not his gospel, were written after his exile on the Isle of Patmos. If you remember any of this, he was exiled off, he lived in, you know, in, on this island called Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation, which is the book in the Bible that is different from all the other books. For Revelation, as the name implies, is a detailed writing by John of the visions he was given about the future of the world. It was revealed to him. And it was revealed that the world would just go into all sorts of strife and, and war and suffering of the people in the world. Us. And the return of Jesus Christ who would then save the world and all of those in it and all of those who had died. Restore the world to its original, original creation, which is still the great promise of God. What I find odd about this is that even after John was shown all of these incredible vision, uh, visions of destruction and war and suffering, he still chose love as the thing he wanted to write about. I mean, he had just been given a vision of the apocalypse, and he starts writing about love. He could have chosen to write about war, especially the war between believers and non-believers. He could have chosen to write about the tyranny and suffering the people would have to endure under the rule of the Antichrist. He could have chosen to write about conspiracy theories and false prophets and people lining up behind dictators and wolves in sheep's clothing who keep promising to protect the people under their rule if they would just go that way, usually identifying everyone else as the enemy and going to war to eradicate them. John could have chosen to write about any or all of those things and succumb to fear as his main emotional inspiration. But he did not. He came out of those experiences, the destruction of the temple, the final separation of the followers of the way of Jesus from the followers of the old way. And remember, at this time, everyone's still basically Jewish including Jesus' followers. But the way of Jesus, it, it took a more direct turn to have love central in the way of living and not a temple of sacrifice. And the love that Jesus talked about, the love that John talked about, the love that the disciples were supposed to exhibit and reflect was the kind of love that keeps you together and not separates you from one another. The kind of love that focuses on the individual as the recipient of God's love, yes, but also reminds us that everyone else is the recipient of this same love, so the focus moves from individual to group. God's love is within, and God's love is within you, and therefore God's love is within us. And as Christianity re evolved, it was supposed to continue that way. But something went terribly wrong. 
just as it did with the first creation and the first specialness of the original chosen people. Greed and feelings of superiority infiltrated this system that had been set up to now guard and keep this love to themselves. A system that still exists today in many places with many churches and whole denominations, keeping a tight rein on who God chooses to love and who he doesn't and taking upon themselves to become the guardians of this, of this uh, secret of who God loves and doesn't. They became the, the righteous and rightful owners of, of God's love, no longer allowing God to decide. They decided themselves, which is exactly opposite of what John wrote. You can hear it in the preaching. Instead of laying down one's life for the love of another, you're told to put on your armor and be ready for war. Instead of being told to welcome the stranger and feed the hungry and visit those who have been imprisoned, you are told to raise the ramparts and keep people out lest you become infected by evil and evil people. Which again, was, every, was and is everyone except themselves. I want to tell you that I actually had a very different sermon in mind earlier this week. I think I've told you before, I don't normally write anything down until very early on Sunday mornings because I want to wait and see if God has any other ideas than the one I've been cooking up. And more often than not, like always, that is the case. And the change came this week after attending the funeral service for Michael Moore yesterday. Because from that service, which was both funeral and memorial, you know, both sad and happy, from that service I took away the following three things. First, that God loved Michael and that Michael loved God. And because of those two things working together, Michael loved others just as God loved him. Second, his path to finding and receiving this love was through Jesus Christ. Michael accepted Jesus as the way he would live his life, and Michael reflected the way Jesus taught us to live showing his love to those that a lot of other people in this world and this community, including a lot of good Christians, would shun and call bad and evil. In the face of persecution that could have led to hiding behind fear, Michael shed that armor he was told to put on and boldly stood as a symbol of love for one another and not hate. He chose love and the embrace of those who had had love withheld from them, and then he showed them a different way. The third thing I learned yesterday was that Michael, he did not keep his love secret. He didn't try to hide the fact that he knew he was a real Christian from those who said he was not. He did not try to hide from the fact that he knew that all the promises made in Holy Scripture were for him just as much as anyone else. The promise of faith, first given to Abraham. The promise of being chosen, first given to Moses and the people of Israel. The promise of freedom, first preached by the great prophets who told of God's freeing them from tyranny and exile. The promise of breaking the chains of the religious elite who had aligned themselves with power and sharing God's love with the people of the land instead of giving everything now to the temple and their government. The promise of healing 
and wholeness in a world that cared little about the needs of the individual, lest it infect those who isolate themselves behind walls and locked doors. And finally, the promise of new and everlasting life in a world that does not like to promise such things, still doesn't like to promise such things, still doesn't want everyone to believe in the resurrection of God's original creation when we were all the same, doesn't want us to believe in the resurrection of love rolling away the stone of entombment, doesn't want us to believe that the resurrection of Jesus, the one whom God sent, not only to save the world, but to give the world and all of its inhabitants life and life in abundance. In the end of John's life, just as in the beginning of our life in Christ, John chose love and so should Three final things I couldn't figure out how to fit in the sermon, so I just put them here at the end. And that is, one, Bob Marley still got it right when he sang about one love in a country and world that was at war with itself. And guess what? Still is. Two, Tina Turner got it right when she questioned whether love would make her vulnerable to being hurt and scared to follow the way of love. And third, that there still is only one love and one way to live in a world that wants us not to love one another, to cast some people out, to ignore them, tell them not to come here, tell them not to be with us, tell them that you're not welcome, but rather, we are to focus solely on those who do come, those who haven't made it here yet, those that we can reach not only within these walls, but all over the world now. Do you know that we've, Michael's funeral service on Facebook alone has had almost 600 views? There was over 100 people here yesterday. That many people don't tune in or come for someone they don't love. And finally, because we know all of this now, because we can take love out of some emotional pocket and actually make it the way we live, we should make a holy noise about all of this. We should go out into the world and make sounds of horns and make joyful noises before the Lord and join in the roaring of the seas and the songs of the hills and sing out about this way of love and be pure in heart and recipient of God's favor to every single person we meet. It's not up to us to judge whether or not they're going to, you know, accept that. It's up to us to tell them they are loved. For we weren't the ones who have chosen God's love for ourselves. We have been chosen because Jesus has shown us the way to receive and share God's love. So let these following words become our closing prayer. Jesus said, I love you with the same love that the Father loves me. I have given you everything that I have. And what I give to you is the joy that my Father and I share. For you are part of us. You are my joy, my life, and my purpose. I want your joy to be full and complete and whole and perfect. You are my friends, and I have held nothing back from you. I have chosen you. I picked you. 
I want you. And I appoint you and commission you to go forth and bear good fruit in my name and to love one another as the Father loves me and I you. And I trust and believe that you can do this because in my name you can do anything. My friends, these are still the promises that are our inheritance too. Amen. Thank you. Uh, let us now take a moment of silence to sit with God. Amen. 